Kilo Delta 2, Charlie Fox from India. Kilo Delta 2, Charlie Fox, India. Thank you very much. You are number 1,059, Virgin Island National Park. Hello, my name is Kevin Thomas, W1DED. Today I have with me John Gendron, November Juliet 4 Zulu. John first came on my radar when I was activating a park in Virginia, the Shenandoah National Park 0064. It was my first time Virginia activation and the first time I was activating with my father, who's 86 years old, Whiskey Alpha 1, Yankee Oscar Alpha. Uh, he got me into ham radio years ago, so it was an important activation for me. And I heard this hunter responding to my CQ. It was very faint. Um, I ended up giving him a 3 by 3 and I couldn't make out his call sign. I was really confused. And come to find out, my confusion came from the fact that he was a KP2 stroke K4 YTZ. Uh, when I finally figured that out, knew I was talking to St. John, U.S. Virgin Islands, I was really pleased that he had the patience to put me in the log. When I got back home to my QTH in Maine, I made a contact again with John, and after listening to the pileup he was attracting, I realized how patient he really was to take the time to have me hear that call. John clearly is a classy and um, talented operator, and I'm really happy to have him with us today. Thanks for being here, John. Oh, it's my pleasure, Kevin, and uh, very pleased to work with you on that uh Pod activation, park to park. It was uh, it was a good contact. I, I, and I've got a lot of patience with that. If I if if I'm really working a pile up, I want to give that park to everybody I can. And you were patient enough to work with me uh, to get that call sign through. I uh, there were some times of the day I was pretty weak to people. It was only 100 watts and a wire, so you know how that goes. Well, it is amazing how your brain sort of fits in the fills in the blanks. And I see this happen a lot with contesting, particularly with call signs that I. I know, and I fill in the blanks, and it it makes more sense. And I just couldn't make sense out of the KP2 backslash. Yeah, I, I think I had to hear it four or five times. So again, thank you for your patience in, uh, in dealing with that. So let, let's get right to St. John. I'm really intrigued by this trip you took to St. John and your activation there. What were the results of that trip? So we logged uh, 2,330, 2,360 contacts for the trip. Uh, we did uh, seven days of activating. I got on island uh, 1026 late in the evening, and that was a Wednesday. Uh, my wife likes to sleep late, especially on vacation, so I'm an early riser. Uh, most mornings I'm up by 5 a.m., so I got up and uh, set up the antennas, put the DX Commander up first, and checked it out, made sure it were operated. Um, and I, I just wanted to test it, and I called CQ Poda. Kilo 0066, and it was like seven o'clock in the morning, and here it came. Um, it was, you know, and and I had kind of put out on the POTA Facebook page and a few other pages that I was going to be active on the island. And all I wanted to do was just check and make sure the antenna was getting out because I severely misjudged the landscape there is where we rented the house and how the land fell around the house. I knew I was going to be on the side of a hill, but I didn't understand how severe it was. It was about a 30 degree down angle um, on the side of the hill. So I had very little room for the antennas. Uh, luckily, I found a flat spot, not ideal side of the house with a wall behind it um, that I was able to set the DX commander and the and the radials out. I used uh, shorter radials. I used five meter radials. Um, and then I used the second floor balcony, uh, one of the posts there to tie off the other mast to get the uh, dipole up. And so we operated that way, but, uh, I didn't expect the first pile up. I was expecting just to make a couple contacts and then go set up the other antenna. And up, I think I ended up working 130 stations in about an hour. Well, it certainly is a good lesson that you need to be prepared before you make that first yeah. CQ, correct? CQ, correct? Turn, turn down the power a little bit, maybe 10 watts, to make sure you're getting out. <laughs> I remember activating down at Mackworth Island and, uh, it was during, uh, support your parks. And I had high hopes for this evening. I had a tent set up. I was going to do late shift. And I had did the same thing. I, I just did a test and, you know, all hell broke loose right away. Um, I think I did somewhere around 210. But the fact is my antenna fell down. My tent almost collapsed because I hadn't really been ready to go on the air yet. So I certainly learned my lesson that as much as I want to make that first CQ or do a test, then there's there's a way to do it. 
So uh, back up a little bit from St. John. You obviously had a lot of success that week. When did you first decide that you wanted to pack up your gear, put it on a plane, and uh, interrupt your vacation with a POTA activation? So this is actually my second activation from St. John. Um, back in 2018, it was my 50th birthday. St. John holds a special place for my wife and I. Um, we have spent a lot of big birthdays and anniversary trips down to St. John's. Uh, this was our eighth trip to the island. Um, but in 2018, I'd been licensed for two years, um, and I really wanted to do something different on my vacation. So my wife asked me, where do we want to go for your birthday? It's her 50th birthday. You know, I said, let's go back to St. John. I want to spend a birthday down there. And we had some friends come with us. So Brent and I went down the first week by ourselves, and I decided to drag some radio equipment. And, and Callum was still developing the DX Commander Expedition model. And so I convinced him to send me one of the poles and a set of plates from the classic, did some modification and got it up and running. And I was able to, I, I was activating off the beach, I had a ship equipment in, batteries and such, because you can't take them on the plane with you. Um, made some friends down at the club down there and said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do this. And I activated, I think, four or five times. I had one act or six times I had one activation that absolutely failed. We had weather and wind and it was just a mess. Um, but the other times I operated directly off the beach, battery power. Um, and I learned a lot from it and I put in 300 and some contacts in the log for that trip. After coming back, I wanted to get more contacts out there. I had so much fun. The pileups were big, but unfortunately myself with battery power, I was only able to run about 90 minutes each time. Um, so I said, when next time I get the opportunity to go back, we're going to go ahead and, and take a full setup, extra antennas, the whole works and do this the right way. Well, of course, 2018, I was planning to go down there in 2020 COVID hits, the trip gets canceled. So we go back to working, you know, with, uh, as soon as we got the opportunity and it was my wife and I's 30th anniversary this year. I said, where do you want to go for anniversary trip? We're going to get back on the road and do some traveling. And she said, let's, let's go back to St. John. So we planned a trip. Her and I went down three days early and we had uh, some family members join us. So there was a total of eight on Island and um, we had a good time. And I was able to operate in times that weren't affecting anybody's, anybody else's joy on the trip. Let's just put it that way. So I hadn't realized that you had gone down back in 2018. That's, that's really interesting. So clearly you learned a lot from that experience. So what, what did the equipment bag look like in 2022 compared to 2018? Uh, 2018, a lot of the equipment was the same other than I had the experimental DX commander uh, with me um, that we kind of just put together. Um, I didn't take as much equipment in 2018. I had an IC7300. Uh, which is a great radio, but I've, I've learned my lesson with the 7300 and pileups. Um, I didn't take an external tuner with me. Um, I took, didn't take an external power supply. Well, no, I did have a power supply with me. I had a regular 12 volt uh, AC mains to 12 volt power supply. I shipped in two lead acid batteries and some other equipment. And since the club down there, 2017, they had Irma and Maria roll through and basically scrubbed the island with those two hurricanes. They had communications were down for months. They had a program through a grant through federal government to get hams operating. So they were giving they were giving the tests and giving all the new hams uh, FT seventies the little handhelds. And um, I went and met with the club and and I had met somebody beforehand, being knowing some people on island that put me in contact with the club with the club down there. And I said, hey, look, I'm going to ship all this stuff down. Whatever I'm not taking back with me is yours to use. You could have it for, for, you know, whatever club activations or any emergency activations you want. So I left batteries. I left a couple of small wire antennas and some other things. So um, 2022, I wanted to go down there and I, I tried to reach back out to the club and I don't know whether the club has failed or if they just didn't reach back out. I don't, I don't know. The person who was in charge the last time was not on island. Um, and he didn't have any contact information for me. So I kind of just said, you know what, I'm taking everything I need with me and I'll see if I can find, if I need something else, I'll see if I can find it on Island, which shouldn't be a problem um, for the most part. I mean, I'm not going to find coax. I'm not going to find connectors. 
So I took a lot of extra stuff with that, but I took the FTDX uh, 10, which is the new portable radio for me. I took uh, the DX Commander Expedition with the proper plates. Um, I set it for 10, 17, 20, 15, and 40. I did an SB9 uh, or an N9SAB uh, off center fed dipole for 10 through 40. So it's 66 feet long. And I took an N fed that was made by Tim Ortiz N9SAB. Um, so those were the antennas and primary equipment. Um, I took a lot of doubles. I'm, I'm a firm believer in two is one and one is none. So if you're going to do something like that and you think there's a possibility something's going to go wrong, something's going to go wrong, take some extra things. So I had 100 feet extra antenna wire. I had extra um, connectors, fork connectors, spade connectors, all that kind of stuff. I had a little kit that I put together. Um, so the big difference was the radio. And the reason I, I chose the FTDX-10 over the 7300, and I know that's a big debate between everybody. Everybody loves that 7300. It's a great radio. But when you get into a severe pileup, the issue with the AGC on the on the um, 7300, it actually works too good. It makes everybody sound the same. And so you get this really, really muddy pileup. So when everybody's coming in, it's hard to pull any kind of call signs on. If you're trying to keep any kind of rate up of contacts, and, and not so much that it's like a contest, but I want to give that park out to how many people I can because it was a pretty rare park having that muddled mess and having to repeat call signs four or five, six times to pull it out just didn't work for me. And I found the FTDX 10 after operating in um, the support your parks plaque events and other POTA activations that I've done that FTDX 10 was far, far better on a pile up end uh, for me to be able to hear call signs coming out of it. Well, I appreciate that distinction. I haven't heard that before between the ICOM and the, uh, the ACO. So thank you for that. So you had three antennas. I, I believe you put them all up. Did you find yourself using all of them? And on, on what occasions did you use them? So I did not end up, end up I ended up using the NFED for just a test to see how it worked. And it was, it was a good antenna. It just did not work as well as the Dipole and the DX Commander. The DX Commander on 40, on 15, um, and on 10 and 17 far surpassed the dipole. And part of that is the fact that I was a, using a vertical close to seawater. Um, there's a very big advantage using a vertical antenna close to seawater. The ground conductivity is, is way up, uh, with, um, with the salt water being nearby. So you get a better launch. You get a little more gain out of those antennas than you do a standard dipole. Now on 20, depending on the time of day. Um, sometimes that DX Commander really shined, and I think it was where it was going and how it was placed. I had that big block wall behind me in the house, so I only had really two angles where it was taking off really well. Uh, but the off-center fed dipole, I got it high enough up above the roof of the house where I was able to get out um, to the east and to the south where I was having issues uh, with the DX Commander. But uh, for the most part, most of the contacts were made on the DX Commander. Um, again, on 20, it was a 50-50 split probably uh, between those two antennas. I can relate to the uh, idea that the the rental or the property isn't necessarily what you think it's going to be. I, I took a trip to St. Vincent in May. I had a limited amount of gear. I'd just been back into ham radio. Um, but I, I had done all the right things, I thought. I, I checked with the hotel. I got permission um, actually had them help me select a room that would be most advantageous. Um, I looked at Google Maps, i done everything, and then I got there and the construction of the hotel just made it impossible to, to get out. So I ended up uh, borrowing a golf cart from the hotel and, uh, you know, one of their batteries and, <laughs> there and you go. going full POTA. Um, <laughs> went out to the, the uh, one of the... Uh, old dilapidated properties that they weren't using anymore on a hill and set up. But uh, getting back to your, your operating style, um, obviously you're on vacation. Uh, were there certain times a day that you decided to operate or how did that work? Sure. Again, I'm, like I said, I'm an early riser. My wife likes to sleep in a little bit and then, you know, eight, nine o'clock. So I would get up and um, start to run at about six thirty or seven on 40 meters. And when everybody else was getting up in the house, um, I'd stop 
eight eight thirty, um, and go get everything ready to go for the day for the beach. We'd go to the beach and we'd come back, usually a late lunch, twelve thirty, one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, by that time, everybody was either going down to the pool or they were going to go have their afternoon siestas. So when they went and had their afternoon siestas, I'd jump on the rig and run for an hour, maybe two. And then in the evening, uh, we would cook dinner together. And the house we rented, it was, <laughs> it was a great house. Beautiful piece of property, just fantastic, appointed well. Um, it had one main room that was a, a great room. So it had the living room, the kitchen, the dining room, all one piece. And, and it was non-air conditioned. So it just had open screen doors where it would let air in and out. We had very, very humid weather. We were down there, a lot of rain. So it was uncomfortable sometimes in that main room. Um, so a lot of people would go sit down on the deck or they'd go to the bedrooms, which were air conditioned. So that gave me some, afforded me some time where I was just the only one in that room. And I was able to operate for, you know, two or three hours usually, Late in the afternoon, evening, six o'clock, seven o'clock after we finished dinner um, until nine, ten o'clock at night. And then when I went to bed and then I'd get up and do it the same thing over again. There's no better way than uh, screaming CQ over and over again to drive the family away. <laughs> <laughs> I've experienced. This. Yeah, they uh, <laughs> yeah, I really actually no complaints from anybody. Um, my family's pretty patient with me and we get along really, really well. Um so I didn't really have anybody complain about uh, about me calling CQ, and and quite frankly, it was more QRZ than it was CQ. Right, right. So, well, I also give you credit that you're able to go to the beach. If it was me, I'd be looking at my watch, I'd be tapping my toes, I'd be thinking about that radio back in the uh, in the antenna setup. I'd want to be back on the air. There was only one day I was really disappointed I didn't get to operate, and that was Saturday, because that was part of the world CQ worldwide. And I really wanted to, to put some numbers up for that. But that was the day that everybody else was coming in. So Brenda wanted to go to the beach early in the morning. I said, let's go to the beach. When she got up, we went to the beach for a couple hours. And then the shuffling of the Jeeps, the luggage, and people started. And I got done. We got back to the house at noon. We left to go down to the dock to start picking people up. And I got back to the house at 7 p.m. So I pretty much lost the whole day and, and I hadn't seen my sisters in a while. So I hung out with them Saturday night. So I think I only made like 65 contacts on Saturday and that was all early in the morning. Only 65. Well, good job. Only 65. Good job with that. <laughs> so you, you mentioned that you learned things from 2018. Obviously you changed your gear bag for 2022. Uh, what did you learn on this trip that you'd do differently on the next one? Because I, I presume there will be a next one. Yeah, there's going to be a next one. I don't know if I'll go back to St. John um, and operate again. I think I've, kind of burned that one down for me. Um, having uh, 22, 2300 contacts there, I, I, I don't know that that's going to bring me, I mean, it'd be fun to operate, but I don't know if I'll operate like I did. Um, I think there's going to be a next one. I What I learned is I'm going to try and minimalize a little bit more um, and take some weight out of it. Uh, I, I, I would not take three antennas this time. I'd probably only take two. Um, I'd probably forget the external tuner because I never used it. Don't need it. Um, everything that I built was resonant and worked really well. And, and the, I'll tell you what, Tim, uh, N9 SAB, he doesn't get enough credit. And I don't think people know about his antennas. Um, if you want a lightweight POTA antenna that is, I mean, the 10 through 40 was less than a pound for the off center fed dipole and it worked like a champ. Now I have a, uh, a bigger one. I have the 80 through 10, which is 135 foot long off center fed. And our team, we had three guys that weren't ran uh, support your parks uh, weekend plaque events. And we were back to back. We won it two years in a row on K four YTZ. The first year was three of us running on that antenna. We put up uh, right at 2,100 contacts. And then we ran, this year with the same antenna and we put up uh, our team that ran it with that antenna ran 1900 contacts out of it in worse conditions than the year before. Um, but, um, and the stuff he makes is fantastic. Um, and it, it worked out really well. It's easy to travel with lightweight, small, uh, perfect for these kind of, you know, when you're, you know, taking a gear out in your truck is one thing 
getting on an airplane with the thing is a whole different animal. You got to worry about weight for check bag. You got to worry about weight for in size of, of carry on bags. So, um, he made some good stuff for that. And I mean, you can build the same thing. I mean, if you're, if you're a home brewer, you can go out there and build that same antenna and make it that lightweight. But, uh, for what I paid for it, it was easier just to have it done and, and take it with me. So you bring up a good point about traveling and trying to, I think you're, you're, you're there's two competing interests, right? You, you want the redundancy, but you also want to pack light. Uh, what did you pack? Not, not in terms of gear, but did you take a couple cases? Um, what, what did that look like? So, um, and, and I would have liked to have more pictures and a little more video. I plan to do some live streaming and I was so concentrated on the radio stuff. I forgot a lot of my camera gear. So a lot of the connecting cables and some other pieces didn't make it, but I carried myself. I carried a, a check bag, uh, that was 44 pounds. That was all the antenna gear and, uh, some snorkel gear and my, uh, clothes and those kind of things. I carried um, a case, which is a seahorse case. It's 14 by 8 by 20, maybe. Uh, that's about the size of a carry-on bag. And that was the radio and all the heavy gear that was expensive and I didn't want in the belly of the plane or I didn't want anybody rummaging through. Um, so I took that with me as my carry-on. Then I had a backpack with camera equipment, my computer, and a book, and, you know, just some other things. But, um that's what I took. My wife took one big suitcase and, and a travel bag and, and that went in her purse and that was it. So we had, um, my check bag going down to the Island was 48 pounds. And, um, I didn't weigh the, the radio case. I would guess it was about 35, 40 pounds. Did the DX commander fit in that case? Yeah. So the expedition is actually kind of small. It's only like 21 inches tall. Um, I left the plates on the bottom, the, the radiating plate and the, the radial plate on the bottom of the antenna. I just took the SO239 out cause I didn't want it to get snagged or get, you know, get twisted and broken while I was in there, even though I had an extra, you don't want to expend it on the tra trip down there. The, um, the soda beams mast I used to put up the dipole is seven meters. It collapses down to about 18 inches. So they both fit in the bag very easily. Um, I had three pieces of coax in there, three, three 50 foot pieces of coax. Um, the radials, I had them bundled up nice and tight, 160 meters worth of radials. Um, and then the, I had two plastic bags with all of the plates and, um, uh, straps and Jubilee clips and all that to put the antennas together and the bungee cords and the extra paracord, all that kind of thing were in two plastic bags, clear plastic bags. And what I did, and I'll give this tip to anybody who's traveling because somebody gave it to me. Um, when you're traveling with those kind of things in your bag, TSA is going to want to take a look, right? So what I did is I wrote a nice email or a nice letter to the TSA. And I said, dear TSA, thank you for your service. I am a licensed ham radio operator. Here is a list of the gear that's in this bag. And here's what its purpose is. And here's a copy of my license. And I put it in one of those clear sheet protectors and I put it right on top before I closed the bag. And the first time I did that was in, in the first trip down to St. John. And I got a little red tag in the bag that they said they inspected the bag. This time when I got to St. John, I opened it up and the tag said, thank you very much for your explanation. Made things easy on the little red tag. So somebody took the time to write me a note. So if you're traveling like that, it's always a good idea to list that equipment. And I did the same thing in my, in my uh, radio case. Oh, that was a little bit easier to explain because I could open it up and explain it to somebody if they asked. But TSA PreCheck is your friend. Global Entry is your friend. They typically won't look at you real funny with that kind of thing. Good tips. I appreciate that. I'll, I will uh, take advantage of that when I go on my next trip in January. So you also used um, both call signs. You used your own call sign, NJ4Z, as well as K4YTZ. Tell us about that and why you did that. Okay, so... I'm the club trustee for our local club, which is the York County Amateur Radio Society in South Carolina. Um, our club is a, a great POTA club. We love POTA. And again, we're back-to-back -back champs for the plaque event for the club activations. We've got, I think this is a, was our eighth kilo. Um, you know, we use that as a draw for people to our club. And um, it was very important for me 
as the club trustee, if I had the opportunity to bring something else home for the club, it was that kilo. Okay. Um, not so much that it was another one to put on the wall, but it was a DX kilo. And I don't think there's many clubs in the country who are active with POTA like we are that have DX entity um, uh, POTAs. And the other reason I did it is I wanted to prove it to the club that we can pull it off. So now I've got a couple other people thinking, hey, this might be a great idea. We can get a couple club members together and we can go do something like this. And we're looking at some stateside stuff just to do a travel one um, and some unique entities, um, something that hadn't been activated before or something that's not been activated uh, and that we can do some some really fun stuff. Uh, we've got some creative people in our club and they, they really do it. So that was the purpose of running K4YTZ. Um, and I knew I was going to get the log for the contacts there. And then there was the personal satisfaction of having, and, and I, I, I tell you, I can run Kilo Papa 2 stroke Kilo 4 Yankee Tango Zulu all day long, but I'm so much more comfortable running my own call sign. And I would get tripped up occasionally when I was calling. So I would start with November Papa 2 or NJ4Z and I'd have to stop and re retrain my brain again. So, uh, but there was personal satisfaction for me that I wanted to close out that Kilo I started in 2018 with, with my call sign, even though the old call sign was a K, uh, KE4PLT. I changed call signs in 2018 right after I got back. But just from a personal standpoint, I wanted to have the kilo for the club and I wanted to have one for myself. So it was a little selfish, but, you know. John, tell me more about the club activity with POTA. I find that really interesting. I, I, as, as most people know, I just got back into the hobby in April, March, April of this year. And POTA was the thing that really ignited my interest. And I've been gung-ho POTA ever since, a little bit of DXing and contesting on the side. Uh, so it intrigues me that it sounds like it's a big uh, effort within your club. To, uh, talk more about that. So our club has been around. It's the oldest operating amateur radio club in South Carolina. It's been around for uh, since 1948. So we're going on our 75th anniversary coming up this year. Um. The club in 2016, when I joined, was kind of dying. And uh, through the effort of many folks, we have rebuilt the club. We went from 36 members. We're about 140 now. And part of that was engagement, right? If you join a radio club, you want to be active in radio. You're not going for a social event. You're not going, you know, although there's a social interaction, you want to learn about radio. You want to live radio, as we call it. So POTA became, we had several folks in our club who liked to do POTA as they joined the club. And some of our leadership was very into, into POTA. Um, Steve W3SPC, who's our current president, um, I think he's got like 20 kilos. I mean, he's always out there activating. He loves to camp and he goes and activate when, he's, when he camps. Uh, but he instilled that in a few other people. And we've got a lady, um, and she's got more energy than half the people in the club, 83i her name is vicky and she goes out and activates all the time and she does small activations she goes out and rooks 100 and 150 contacts but when it comes to events she wants to do big numbers so she was part of our support your parks but we use that as activation as, as an engagement so we get new members in whether they're a technician or they're a general as soon as they become a member one of us is grabbing them and saying let's go do a poda activation so we get them on air. If they're a technician, we run them with the club call sign. If they have their general, we run them with their own call sign. So we get them fired up about it. And the club goes out and does every quarter, does at least one activation as a club. So we'll get 20, 30, 40 members and we'll go out to a park and, you know, we'll set up two antennas, two rigs, and we'll run until everybody's tired. Um, or we've drained a pond of everybody who wants to talk to us. So it's, it, it's all about engagement. If you get people engaged in ham radio when they first get their license, they're going to stick with it, typically. Um, the worst thing you do is get somebody licensed and leave them on their own. Because if if they don't get on the air um, within the first six months, they're never getting on the air. Um, and handhelds are fine. They're great. Two-meter repeater, all that stuff's great. But when you set that hook with HF in an at POTA activation, that's a whole different animal for them, right? They get it. They they get that atmospheric bounce. They get the excitement, especially if they get a DX contact. 
that usually sets the hook and they're, they're set for life. I mean, I, I know that's what set the hook in me. I got my license. Um, my uncle, um, who's now a silent key got me involved. I went to visit him in Canada. I was still a technician. Um, he got me on HF. And as soon as I got that HF bug, I was done. I was a general within a month of getting back and I was an extra within three months of that. So, you know, it, it's all about engagements. And, and once you engage people, they're going to stay with you. So that's what's fueling the growth for club. The other part of that is it makes for better operators. So it's actually helping our Aries program. Um, people are involved in, involved in POTA. They seem to be involved in Aries too. So we get that crossover. So that's, that's why I think it's so important to have if you're if you're a club and you're looking to grow your club, engage your people. Use POTA. I think it's, it's a great analysis, and I, I've heard a lot from ham radio operators that POTA has re-energized the HF community, and I think that's what you're, oh, yeah, you're explaining. Oh yeah, definitely I mean, you think about all these people who live in HOAs that can't put up antennas, or they've got spouses that aren't <laughs> supportive of you know, like yours, yours is and mine is a, of, of the hobby. And they know our passion for it. Um, they can go out and do something simple. I mean, you don't have to have a fifteen hundred dollar radio to go out there. You can get, you know, a four or five hundred dollar radio or a used radio and and go out there and throw up a simple wire antenna, one of the chameleons, or you know, just a, a simple vertical you build yourself or a dipole you build yourself, and you have a heck of a lot of fun. And you know, there's QRP guys that love to run QRP, um, and just see how far they can get that signal out there. It doesn't matter how many contacts they made. It's more about that one that keeps them coming back. Um, the, you know, they're the guy that talks coast to coast on five watts. He's like, oh, my God, or across the pond, five watts. He's like, that brought him back. I mean, it's like to go one, if you're a golfer, the one golf shot of the day that you hit that was perfect and it felt right, it brings you back the next time. John, with your experience with POTA, you must have some insight into where you'd like to see the program go in the future. What, what would that look like for you? Um. So I'm, I'm a different POTA operator. I go in, I law, I don't go out every day. I don't have time to do that. Um, I'm one of these guys that goes out and will spend four or five days at a spot or six days at a spot. And I'll put a thousand, 1500, 2000 in the lock. That's, that's, the, that's POTA to me. I know there's people, I mean, f- my friend Dom, um, NC4XL, I mean, he goes out and activates every day. And, and, and if you're a POTA hunter, you know who NC4XL is. Um, and he's very active. He's very passionate about it. And he goes out and works 150, whatever he's going to do for the day. And that's that brings him joy, and that's his thing. Where I would like to see POTA go is expand it, the DX part, and they're doing a good job with that. Um, but I would like to see a little tweak in, in some of these twofers and threefers um, I know it's fun to activate three or four of those entities at one time, but in reality, you know, when you log one contact and accounts for two or three, I'm kind of a purist like that. I like to contest too. So, um, I look at that as, you know, it's a one for one. So if I make one from Kilo, Kilo 0066, or I make one from 2824, they need to be separate contacts from me. Um, you know, I think Jason and his staff, I mean, they're, they work tirelessly at this. They do a fantastic job. Um, and, and, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of taken on its life of its own from where it went from, uh, the national park service parks on the air, uh, deal in 2016 to where it is now. I mean, they've done an amazing job and I know the effort that goes in there because there's several of our club members are involved in staff as, as log coordinators or area coordinators and have helped with, you know, the, the software pieces of it. So I know the background work and, and, and people don't appreciate it. I mean, they do an amazing job. I think the expansion into DX community is going to help out a little bit for me personally. I'd like to see them change some of the rules about the two first and three first, but the rest of it, I mean, the roves are cool. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about doing one of those, um, I don't know. I mean, I think just it's taken on a life. It's its own. And, and I think everybody just needs to go out and experience it and do it for themselves and what works for them. I don't know that they can make many more changes, at least in my head, that would 
improve it anymore other than expanding the DX uh, entities, especially as we come into the top of the solar cycle. I mean, I don't know how much you're on the rig. I have a lot of seat time when I'm home by myself and I like to get on and, and work DX too. And 10 meters and 12 meters and 15 meters have been just insane the last couple of weeks. In fact, I haven't had as much radio time as I wanted to. And this weekend we had our ham fest and we had uh, something else going on in the family. And I kept getting the spots come up and, and 10 meters was just wicked open. And I'm like, and I'm sitting here and I can't go work the radio. So, um, but you know, Jason and, and, and that whole staff Vance and, and Matt and all of those guys and that, you know, there's so many of them, you can't name them all. They've just done a tremendous job with, with POTA and it, and it has revitalized ham radio. It's changed it. Um, you know, I don't think you'd see the growth in ham radio, uh, over the last three, four or five years if, if POTA wasn't there. Totally agree. And I'm also excited about the expansion of parks into the DX world, uh, both parks and activators, and making more of an effort actually to, to look on the spotting page and go look for those those activators to make sure they feel uh, um, supported. I was on the radio yeah, this but, morning um, talking to, uh, I think it was uh, Two Echo Zero Hotel Papa India, um, mm. and uh, Mike Mike Zero, Mike Mike November has been pretty active lately. So mm-hmm. I'm in a good position here in, in Maine um, to make those European contacts first thing, thing in the morning. But it's it's been fun because I, I'm seeing more and more on the spotting page. Um, also, it's exciting um, for those of us um, that would like to get on a plane and activate a DX location. I, I like the fact that Jason and his crew are looking at um, authorizing more parks in, in uh, the Caribbean, for example. I I, as I've said, I hope to go back to St. Vincent, um, had a couple conversations with Jason about maybe finding a park down there and, and not just setting up my gear and making contacts, but I'd love to do a POTA activation, um, in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. So we'll see if that happens, but any final words for everybody, John? No, I mean, it, POTA's fun, right? If you're a POTA person, get out there and activate, whether it's 10 for the day to get your activation or it's a thousand for the week or 10,000 for the week, whatever, get out there and have fun with it. I mean, that's, that's the whole purpose of the ham radio. It's, it's a hobby. Um, and you, it's supposed to bring you relaxation. It's supposed to bring you joy. It's supposed to bring you happiness. So, uh, get out there and enjoy the outside, get out there and enjoy the radio and, uh, make some friends. And please remember, be a good ambassador for ham radio. When you're a POTA activator, um, there's times when we get frustrated with, other entities that are sharing the bands with us that maybe we feel are QRMing us, but try to be a good steward and, and a good ambassador for ham radio. And, you know, just try to see, see the good and, and just, you know, QSY if you have to, I mean, it's, it's all I can tell you. I mean, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, if, if somebody's QRM in me at a hundred Watts, I'm not going to have the power to, to, to come back to that. I'm like, just QSY, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff in the on the Facebook pages about people complaining about nets and other things coming up on top of them. And and believe me, I share those frustrations with you, but it's so much easier just to QSY. You know, I'm glad you ended on that note because I think it's something that doesn't come up often enough. But I, I think that not only being a good ambassador, but you know, learning when to back down and just just move on rather than engage in the fight. It just uh it is one of the small discouraging things I've find about ham radio when people want to want to engage in the argument. It's just not worth it. Move on, have fun as you, as you properly put it. You know, and, and I had, I had a net come up on me and, and, um, from carousel and the guy came up 10 minutes early and said, Hey, we're close to you. Would you mind moving? And I said, absolutely. So I told everybody, I said, I'm going to take two more and I'm going to find a clear frequency. And I came back to that frequency, gave everybody the frequency and moved. It's that simple. And even if they don't give you that courtesy, be the bigger person. Good advice. I've been talking to John Gendron, November Juliet 4 Zulu. Uh, he just finished a, a pretty successful de expedition, POTA style, in St. John, the U.S. Virgin Islands. I know you'll find him out there again, uh, whether it be down south or at uh, another POTA DX location. So look for him on the spotting page. John, thank you for taking your time today. Oh, it's my pleasure, Kevin. And thank you for all you're doing. And, and I enjoy your channel and what you're doing. So, uh, it's great to bring that to, to other hams so that they can learn, and we all all want to learn in this hobby. So, fantastic job. Thank you to Colorado. Anybody else? Can they just have a few clips of it? Kilo Delta 2, Charlie Parks from India. Uh, Kilo Delta 2, 
to Charlie Fox, India. Thank you very much. You are number 1,000. 5'9", Virgin Island National Park. Roger, Roger, thanks for that. You are 5'7", into, into November Yankee at the Canadian border, QSL. Thank you, November Yankee at the Canadian border. 7 good evening, and Thank you, everybody.